The 1960s was a pretty fun time to be a particle physicist. They were discovering new particles that no one had ever seen before. They found these particles in cosmic rays coming from outer space, and they also found them in particle accelerators when they smashed particles together at high speeds. In fact, there were so many of these, they called it a particle zoo. <laughs> kind of a fun name. You know, you wake up Saturday morning, you say, uh, your parents tell you, hey kids, time to go to the zoo. And you reply, oh gosh, I hope the Xi particle is there. That's my favorite. So the particle zoo was sort of posing a problem because no one understood what was inside these particles. Are they fundamental? Can they be broken into smaller parts? Why are there so many? Well, there are moments in physics when we make a change because we want to find a simpler model. And that's what happened here. Two physicists, they were uh, Murray Gell-Mann and George Zweig, they came up with a new model that simplified everything a ton. And it was the quark model, which we already know and love. Well, the quark model, which we already know, maybe. And the quark model said all of these different hundreds of particles you found can be explained using six types of quarks. The six types are up, charm, top, bottom, down, and strange. And so you can represent each one of these as a combination of those six, plus their antimatter counterparts. Okay, let's take a look then. Here is the quark composition for all those particles. But they noticed something kind of interesting. Some of these particles hang around for much longer than other particles. All of them decay. They all disintegrate or turn into something else, turn into other particles. But, but look at this. Check this out. Let me get my highlighter out. This one lasts for a lengthy 10 to the negative 8 seconds. This one here lasts for 10 to the negative 10. Uh, this one lasts still pretty long compared to the others, 10 to the negative 12, 10 to the negative 11. Look at how much longer those ones last. They decay way, way slower. Why do those particles decay so slowly and the others decay so quickly? It's kind of strange, don't you think? Do you see any reason, any reason why this strange property, this strangeness might, uh, is there anything causing it? You see a distinction? It's the strange quirk. This strange quirk does not decay in as many ways as these other particles can decay. So if you've got a strange quirk or an anti-strange in your particle, man, it's going to be harder for you to decay. You know, these guys can only decay via strange quarks, only decay via the weak force or the weak interaction. And for that reason, we say the strangeness is conserved, except in weak interactions. So that was something new, you know, uh, and we thought maybe we should keep track of this property, strangeness. So we're going to count it. We're going to give it a number. We're going to count the strangeness. And here's how we count strangeness. If you see a strange quirk, that counts for negative one. So this guy has a strangeness of negative two. This has a strangeness of negative one. This one, what's the strangeness? You got it negative 3. I wrote 1, but said negative 1. And this one, because it's an anti-quark, it has a strangeness of positive 1. So this strangeness value, the total strangeness, does not change during a decay or interaction unless it's a weak interaction. What does that mean? Well, let's look at one really quick example. Here's my Feynman diagram. I've got a strange quark, and it's going to change 
it emits a, uh, uh, some sort of exchange particle, and it changes into, let's say, an up quark. And there's more to this, you know, you get an anti-down, there's more stuff that happens, but let's just focus on this. What is this exchange particle? Well, don't look at the charge, okay? Don't look at the charge. Because you could figure it out from charge, but it doesn't matter if we look at the charge. We know immediately strange quarks only decay via the weak nuclear force. So this has to be either a W, w plus boson, or a W minus boson, or a Z neutral boson. It has to be one of those three because that's the only way for a strange quirk to decay. We're going to focus now on a particular type of uh, meson called the pion. And the pion comes in three varieties. There's the positive pion, the neutral pion, and the negative pion. This guy has a charge of 1e, and this has a charge of negative 1e. This has no charge. So what's the quark composition? Well, you've got an up, whose charge is positive 2 thirds of the elementary charge, and you've got a down, whose charge is negative 1 third e. But clearly this is wrong. If you add it, you don't get positive 1. So we realize, oh wait, it's an anti-down. And then we flip the sign. And now that makes a total charge of positive 1. The negative has, it's a similar kind of story. You've got an up quark whose charge is positive 2 thirds e, and a down quark whose charge is negative 1 third e. But this does not make negative 1. We actually need this to be an anti-up quark, or an up anti-quark. So what does that make it? Uh, well, instead of positive, we flip the sign, negative. And together, that gives negative 1. The neutral pion is going to be either up and anti-up, or down and anti-down. Now, I want to briefly point out the relationship between this guy and this guy. Is there any relationship between them? Do you see anything? Wait a second, look at their quarks. They are antiparticles of each other. The anti-positive pion is going to be, what would that be? Well, you take the up and you make it anti-up. You take the anti-down and you flip it back to down. And that's exactly what we have over here. That is the negative pion. And it makes sense, because if you do the antiparticle, then the sign should flip from one to the other, positive to negative, or negative to positive. All right. We are going to focus on this pion, and there's a specific reason. You might be wondering, like, of all the different mesons, why the pion? Well, we are going to focus next on the difference between the strong force and the nuclear force. And you might be thinking, aren't they the same thing? I mean, I know I've mixed the two up before when I'm speaking. Sometimes I'll interchange them. There is a subtle difference, and here it is. Think about a proton. A proton. Or is it not a proton? It's a proton, bruh. The proton has two up quarks. Proton. And a down quark. Let me draw a proton. You've got an up an up, and a down. And that makes up the proton. But what binds them together? What is it? It's the strong force. So the strong force is mediated by gluons, which we will sometimes draw as these squiggly lines. So let's now zoom out and look at a nucleus. And I'm going to draw a nucleus that has one proton, and one neutron. And you might think these are the same, but look, there's an extra D here in place of the U. So what binds the proton to the neutron? It's the nuclear force. But is that different from the strong force? Not really. You can talk about this, this attraction using gluons, and that would actually be the most accurate way to diagram or discuss the attraction. We really should be using gluons if we want to be perfectly accurate. 
But scientists back in the day, they didn't know about gluons yet. They didn't know about, you know, the, uh, the quarks inside. And here's what they thought. They thought pions, virtual pions, mediated this attraction inside the nucleus. And it's kind of a weird idea that you've got, you know, this virtual pion as the exchange particle, but it it works. I mean, it's pretty good. You do your math this way, you know, you do the calculations, and you will get very close results. I mean, it's a very good approximation for what's happening. So why? Because if you look over here, you know, and you try to talk about the ups and down quirks, you can't use a pion. It's not going to it's not going to go so well. What's the difference? Well, you can make this approximation. We can approximate the pions as being the exchange particles at larger distances. Relatively large. So this is something we do at a larger distance. Bigger scale. If you zoom in and you look inside a proton, you better not use pions. You got to go back to the true uh, the gluons, the true exchange particles. So let's see this in a Feynman diagram. Here is my time. Uh, I'll do a horizontal time axis. And you've got a proton here. Let's say that's matter. You've got a neutron here. Also matter. And they are going to pull on each other. They're going to attract. And that attraction requires an exchange particle. There it is. <clears throat> it is a pion, but what kind of pion is it? We're going to look at that in just a moment. So this is attraction. Neither the proton nor the neutron changes. They stay neutrons and protons. But uh, they pull. They exert a force. So we need an exchange particle. So what is the what is the pion? Is it the positive, negative, or neutral? Well, let's look at this uh, vort vertex. The initial is just the proton, and its charge is positive one. The final is the proton plus the pion, so the charge here for this proton is positive one, and we're already equal, so we can't add any extra charge for the pion. It must be a regular old neutral pion. And if you look down here at this vertex, you're going to see. I will leave it as an exercise for you to check this vertex. Look at the total charge coming in. Does it match the total charge coming out? Let me show you another one of these pion interactions inside the nucleus. Here's my time axis. I'm just going to draw it. And I want you to kind of think through what's happening. Now I know what you're expecting. You're expecting the neutron here. Haha. -ha. This is another way it can happen. You can actually turn the proton the proton into a neutron and have the neutron turn into the proton. Which is kind of cool. So what kind of pion does that require? Well, we check here. We say the total charge coming in is zero. This proton has a charge of positive one. Uh-oh. So the pion should have a charge of negative one, so that it totals zero. The initial must equal the final on the whole. All right, then. What we have is a negative pion. And if you're still not so convinced about the pion, why do we draw the pion? What's the point? Um, well, there's a good reason that might be more convincing. If you want to represent this using gluons, the picture is going to get way more complicated. And so it's actually kind of nice to show just the pion, 